Hey folks, Morgan here. Today's episode is Raven's Monologue, as read by the chaotic arsonist himself. This is one of our Patreon bonus episodes made accessible for all you lovely listeners. This is our second of three hiatus episodes. The third will be a never-before-seen short story, also from our Patreon, read by yours truly. Stick around to the end to find out when season 2B will be kicking off. So without further ado, Raven's Monologue. I imagine I am far away, in a place where no one knows me, where no one expects anything from me, where no one who does can find me, or stop me, or get in the way. I am stood atop a cliff, and from here I can see forever. The sea breaks in curves of foam, hammers relentless, unthinking against the chalk. It glints in tones of blue and grey and green, and the hint of a spectrum we could only dream of, and arcing above the inky depths of the sky, just beginning to get light as the sun drags itself up to the horizon. I wonder, does it ever get tired? That same monotonous journey, each day with no thanks, no reward, And one day it will sputter out, collapse under all that pressure, and we will blame it for the destruction that causes. Not the system that made this ruin inevitable, not its creator, with every power to prevent the fall of dominoes that led us there, who instead just sits and watches and dances in the flames. The grass beneath my feet is cool against my fevered skin. I imagine it reaching up to lace around my ankles, Tie me down when gravity fails to do so. It would keep me here when I try to fly. Catch me when I try to fall. It would show me visions of flowers, of clear skies and sunrise, just to distract me. Waiting for the tree that might one day grow in my stead, fed by my rotting, stagnant form. A dream that will never come true. But there are some dreams that might. I imagine the scent of smoke on the wind, ashes brushing past my cheeks and out to sea. I know what I will see, even before I look, for my chest is light, and I breathe easy, and the rocks far, far below don't call to me the same way they used to. I don't need to look to see the fire. Maybe I shouldn't look. Maybe it's supposed to make me feel sick. Maybe my heart should hammer in my chest, and I should cry and I should sink to my knees as the cinders tangle in my hair and set my form ablaze. Instead, I turn to see the city in flames. I am hundreds of miles away, stood here on these pale cliffs, yet there is nothing to block my view of a skyline crumbling to dust. The fire ravages each building in turn, climbing them with ease, gutting them from the inside out. It eats away at the night sky, angry and hungry and bright. I see dark figures stumbling through the carnage, screaming and know with utter certainty that it was my hand that set them ablaze. The ash in my lungs is wood and brick and flesh and it settles familiarly either side of my heart. The scent of flames has followed me for years. When I was a child, It was just a memory that wasn't yet mine. A dream I'd always had of escape, of a clear skyline, with nothing to halt my path. It kept me ablaze inside when the rest of me was dying and cold, locked in iron chains and anchored to obligation. Tradition, the desperate smoking embers of a family inflated with self-importance. My father was deathly afraid of fire, It killed my mother, you see. Perhaps that's the more important part of the story. A smoking pipe left lit while she dozed on the sofa, which claimed the house in a matter of an hour. It consumed every trinket, every book, every heirloom. It crawled the walls, climbed the stairs, twisted its limbs around support beams, chewed up bricks and spat them out in a scattering of char. My father was out at work, my sister at school, I was home with a fever, or so I'd claimed. Truly, I just didn't feel like going to gym that day. My mother stayed home from work to look after me. 
I was in my bedroom at the time, eleven years old, plagued already by my chains, without the vocabulary or rage to shake them. I was doing my best impression of a sick child reading a new book beneath the covers of my bed, The Northern Lights. It went entirely over my head, but I loved it all the same. The image of a child running feral across rooftops. Untamable. A soul that couldn't be contained, that could transform into anything it dreamt of. I've always loved that book. I feel as if it's buried somewhere deep in my heart, as if when it went up in flames, I inhaled every word. Maybe I only love it because I was reading it that day. Maybe if the pipe had flickered out, or my mother had woken in time, I simply would have shelved it and carried on with the rest of my life. A lot of life can be explained away by maybes. Maybe the world should be softer. Maybe I should be kinder. Maybe those two things aren't connected at all. Maybe I was just born wrong. I live in those moments in between maybes, in the imagining, in the dreams of a different life, a different choice, a different death. It was the smell of smoke that found me first, that has lived inside my lungs ever since. I sometimes wonder if there really are clouds inside me, if I carry the debris of that old house, that old life, if that's the reason I'm anchored here. When it reached me, I didn't move. I was far too familiar with the smoke. It already lived in our clothes, in the walls, in the stained teeth of my mother's smile. Even when the heat began to filter in, I assumed that maybe I'd done too thorough a job of making myself seem ill and given myself a fever. It was the sound that finally drew my attention, the groan of wood struggling as the structure was gutted. The hiss and crack of flames consuming the world, I emerged from my bed to find them already climbing the stairs, the floor creaking under my weight. For a moment, I was frozen, mesmerized by their twist and curl, the way they seemed to dance and beckon me to join them. They were alive in a way I had never been, and despite the carnage around me, I was called to them. To my credit, I still tried to get downstairs. Maybe I was trying to find my mother, or at least save some of the priceless artifacts my father had cherished throughout his life. Maybe I hadn't quite lost my heart yet, back then. Or maybe I was simply answering the call. But fire is senseless and hungry, and within seconds it was reaching for my skin, my clothes, my breath. My lungs were heavy, my breaths mere impressions of air. I ended up throwing myself from my bedroom window. Quite dramatic, really. They found me wandering the garden, breathless, rambling, burnt. The worst burns are the ones you can't feel, the sort that will live with you forever. A mess of ruined nerves and gnarled skin. They offered me new nerves, new skin, to cover up the damage, but even then, I clung to my scars, the small things that meant I couldn't fit into my mother's perfect jigsaw puzzle family. I hadn't felt the flames lick across my arm, but I felt the boil of my blood as it settled in my veins, in my heart, where it would live for years. My father was terrified of fire for the rest of his life, wouldn't even light a candle or go near the gas cooker in the kitchen. My sister carried on with her stiff upper lip as if nothing had ever happened. She had responsibilities after all, now that our mother's shoes needed filling. Maybe I should have been afraid, but the first time I struck a match and held it to a piece of paper, watched it curl and crumble in my fingers, I knew it was part of me, and I could never hate it. Fear it, surely. But fear and awe are far too entwined to bother with semantics. Paper burns best, I learned. Brittle autumn leaves burn well, too. Wood is traditional but takes too long and leaves too much behind. Hair is like a flash fire, over in an instant, but the smell won't wash out for weeks. <laughs> I lost my eyebrows more than once that way. Feathers are the most satisfying. They curl and scatter like gossamer, and even when they are nothing but ash, they can still float on the wind, as they always have. I passed years that way, cultivating the flames, and by the time my father died, it was all I knew. The day he died was the day my life ended. Though not for all the ridiculously sentimental reasons you might think. I was twenty. The world had been burning for nine years. My sister had already followed the path, begun to dress like her mother had, talk 
like our mother had, be our mother, as if wearing her skin might be enough to bring her back to life. Might just be as good as having her in front of us, holding us, tucking us into bed at night, telling us to follow our dreams. Not that she ever would have done that. Our mother was just as chained to her traditions, just as drenched in the stink of money and rot and distance as the rest of this collapse in bird's nest. So really, she's emulating our mother perfectly. Our father's death was nothing interesting. I hadn't been home in years, didn't even know he was on his way out the door until I received the news. Maybe I should have felt something. Maybe I should have come home immediately. Instead, I set fire to the records building where he used to work. I'd already planned it, so I can't say that it was an homage, really. But it felt like letting him go, and the smoke was enough to make tears fall from my watering eyes. I was hardly ever going to thank him for dying, but I certainly wasn't going to mourn him either. All this truly meant was an end to the freedom I had cultivated the past few years, as the shackles of tradition passed from his wrists to mine. I imagine myself shifting form, sprouting wings. I am high in the air, high above a thickening of suck clouds. The forecast is supposed to be cloudless, and up above them all the sun has begun to blaze, the answering fires below a mystery smothered by smoke. I dive through the clouds, eager to see the aftermath. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. When the volcano at Pompeii erupted, the city was covered in ash for thousands of years, buried and forgotten and utterly ruined. In 1815, Mount Tambora erupted, and the following year there was no summer. A volcanic winter that starved the world and gave birth to monsters. Here, flying above the ruins of a smouldering city, I imagine the fallout of my rage to be that of the gods. I see the trees that line the roads, now little more than clouds of flame. I see the market stalls ablaze, fabric and food and all sorts of trinkets turning black and blowing away in the wind. I see the law courts, the prisons, and the schools turn to dust, all of it so brittle, so old and unchanging, that it must always have been meant for the inferno. I imagine the embers floating upwards, getting tangled in my wings. I imagine the sparks catching, consuming until I am nothing but a blaze of burning feathers, a smudge streaked against the sky. Maybe this will finally be enough to tire it out. Maybe when the dust settles and the last cinders fade to black, I will be burnt out and hollow and achingly, desperately alive. I will feel something other than the steady boil of rage and the free fall of the void. Freedom is really what we expect it to be, so I expect very little. I don't expect it to fix me, I don't expect it to pave over the last 22 years. I don't expect my hatred to be enough to smother the inevitable senseless grief I might feel at gutting my roots and learning to fly. I imagine flying for years, for centuries. I imagine watching the last of the fires go out high above, little more than a ghost made of ash and soot. I watch the remaining structures collapse and shift and settle, and slowly I imagine life being breathed back into the city. Nothing human, nothing broken. I imagine weeds shooting up from the remains of my sister's house, curling through her daughter's bedroom. I imagine flowers bursting forth from the bricks of council rooms, calling wasps and bees to feed on them. The world is ashen grey, the perfect canvas for colour. I imagine life breathed into a city that died long before it burned. I imagine my ashen form broken. Finally, by a single gust of wind, the wind beneath my wings vanishes and I am tumbling into freefall. I imagine myself as Icarus, the boy who fell from the sky when he reached too high for the sun, who had lived his entire life inside a tower because of his father's crimes, dreaming of freedom. Can you imagine anything worse than that? Trapped day in, day out with the one person who caused all your suffering, who expects you to be grateful for existing at all, knowing that the sentence forced upon you, your life, your punishment, was by no fault of your own. Your parents looked at their lives and decided that another deserved to suffer with them. It is an inherently selfish act to bring a child into the world by choice. I wonder, when Icarus's wings melted, was he relieved? He spent all his days looking through the window, watching Helios, god of the sun, trek thanklessly across the sky, trapped too in an endless cycle of days. 
he saw Poseidon, god of the sea, relegated to the waves by familial obligation as a supposed reward for his time spent trapped, literally, inside his father. And Icarus saw the tower for what it truly was a microcosm of the world beyond the window. Leaving would only ever be exchanging one prison for another, overshadowed always by his great, preoccupied father. The only true escape could be to burn it all to the ground. Let the feathers burn away and fall. Fall as far as you can, and then fall further, until they will never find you, never think to look for you, until you are unrecognizable and unchained and free. I imagine myself scattered across the world. I settle in the ruins I made to make something new of myself. I settle atop my cliff in the crushed grass left behind by my feet all those imaginings ago. I am cast far out to sea and as I tumble towards the waves the sun hits the horizon and explodes in tendrils of pink and orange burning across the sky breathing life into a new day. I fall in fresh bright light which catches the motes of my new form sets them ablaze and spinning like planets, whether I sink into the sea or am borne aloft by the wind. I am a falling star, escaping gravity, and I am free. Thank you for listening. Today's episode was performed by Drew Citrine as Raven, with editing by Isaac Thompson. Season 2B will begin releasing July 31st. We'll be back to our regular fortnightly schedule. And, instead of announcing each episode's title in the credits as we used to, we'll be giving it to you in Trinivi, the language of Trinivantum, for all you lovely red string theorizers to put together if you so desire. With that in mind, the title of episode 31 is Ante Ruina. See you then!